Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome back to another review. Today it's a brand new and completely unique steam locomotive from Hornby. Today's model was announced long ago and it's been highly anticipated ever since then. Finally though, it has arrived in stock and it is this, the all new LMS Turbomotive from Hornby. And this is available now from Hornby themselves at an RRP of £266.49 or around £240 at the retailers. And I have to say right off the bat that I am confused by the price of this model. I can't imagine what about this model could possibly justify that sort of money. Now Hornby have said that these models have die cast bodies, which I think is fantastic. That's a high quality feature. I think it's much better that these models have metal bodies than plastic ones at this sort of price. But the thing is, we've just seen Acura Scale release their Mana Class locomotive, which also had the die cast body, and that thing cost £169.99. This turbo motive is some £70 more expensive than that at the retailers, and it's almost £100 more expensive than that on RRP. So they're not even in the same ballpark. Now, usually when I complain about the high price of obscure models like this, a lot of people tell me it's because it's an obscure prototype, so Hornby don't expect to sell many, and so it's this expensive to cover the costs. But honestly, I've always rejected that as an excuse, for the simple reason that no manufacturer in their right mind, least of all Hornby, is going to invest all of that money in a new model like this that they don't think is going to sell a lot of units. No, Hornby know that models like this sell a lot of units because they've done it so many times in the past. Look at their P2s, their Stevenson's Rockets, their Lions, their Hush Hush Locos. People love these models and more importantly, they buy them, even if they're inappropriate for them in terms of the period, the era or even the geography. So no, for me, the obscurity of this model does not give it an excuse to be 70 to 100 pounds more expensive than a comparable model. But is this comparable to other models we've seen before? At the moment, I do not know. Maybe this has got features and details that are unprecedented. Maybe the quality of this model is gonna be better than I've ever seen from any other manufacturer. If all this is true, then maybe this will be worth the money, but that's what we need to find out today. And if you'd like to find out too, I have got affiliate links down in the description for you, so check those out if you like. For now though, is this worth the money? Has it been worth the wait? And should you buy one at a quarter of a thousand pounds? Well, let's find out. So this model came in Hornby's new packaging, which is much larger and more sturdy than the old type, which is great to see. And we've also got this beautiful image of the engine on the front of the box, which allows you to appreciate how bizarre the turbomotive really was. Like I said at the start, it is indeed a unique locomotive, and I'll talk to you all about it in just a second. If I show you the end of the box, you can see we've got a brief history on the turbomotive here, so pause and read that if you'd like to. And then we've got Hornby's own line drawing on the end of the box, which is dated 2022, and I always really enjoy looking at those. And then if I show you the other end of the box, you've got a larger line drawing of the engine, which is also awesome to look at. So great packaging, definitely much better than it was in the past. Let me show you the end of the box. So the product code I've got is R30134. It is the LMS Princess Royal class. Interesting that they put that on the box. And the turbo motive, which is a 462, and it's number 6202. And these are DCC ready, with a 21 pin DCC socket, presumably in the tender. I'll show you that later on. For now though, let's lift the lid and let's try and take our first look at Hornby's new and incredibly expensive turbomotive. All right, so we've got foam packaging here. Let's peel this back. And there's the engine inside. Wow, cannot wait to get my first proper look at this. I'm expecting it to be very heavy and also very impressive. 
but uh, I'm sure it will be. Hornby's latest locos, the P2s in particular, have been exactly that. And pulling this out, yeah, the box is very front heavy. Uh, the end where the loco is is noticeably a lot heavier than the end where the tender is, which is what you'd expect. That's good to feel. Let's have a look at the paperwork then. This might give us some more information on this model and its features. Princess Royal Turbomotive. All right, let's open this up. So a bit about lubrication. Yeah, just the axles and the crank pins. Accessories, it looks as though we do get drivers with this, which is awesome. You've also got a lamp to fit to the smoke box door. That's pretty interesting. And Hornby's usual set of trailing wheels, which either has the flanges if you've got broad curves or no flanges if you've got tighter curves. I assume the flangeless ones will be fitted. Close coupling, oh, how bizarre. So it looks as though we've got a standard drawbar this time with the screws, the old type, not the new push together type. So that's strange. I guess maybe this was developed before Hornby made that change. I don't know. I did rather like that push together drawbar and it's a pity we're not seeing it again here. And then we've got DCC decoder and sound fitting. This is not expected either. We've got the socket here inside the loco, not inside the tender. So I was incorrect with what I said earlier on. The text though says that to fit a 21 pin decoder to your turbomotive, remove the two assembly screws in the tender as per figure eight. Right, that's definitely not the tender, that's the loco. So once again, Hornby have not read through their instructions and the text and the images do not match up. So actually I'm not sure where the DCC decoder goes. Hopefully a bit more attention to detail will have been paid to the actual model. We'll have a look. And then rear lamp lighting control. Gosh, to toggle the rear lamp of the tender on and off, tap both sides of the tender simultaneously using your index finger and thumb as shown in figure 10. The rear lamp will change color with the direction of travel, red when the locomotive is traveling forward and white when traveling backwards. So we have a new feature for Hornby here. This must be a die cast tender then because it's using the capacitance of your body, I guess, to turn the lights on and off. We'll see how that works. That is a very, very interesting idea. Right, first look at the turbomotive then. Let's slide off the packaging. I guess we should take a look at the accessories to start with, so let's do that. Here we go. So yeah, we do have the painted crew, which are excellent. I must say I prefer these to the colour 3D printed figures. They just look better, they haven't got the layer lines on them, and also the hand painting produces better and vivid colours, which I think is more ideal. We've also got brake rigging for you to fit if you want, very elegantly painted steps, which you can put on there, a lamp, which looks marvellous, it's got a proper lens on it and everything, front coupling, we've got the flanged axle for the rear of the loco, and also a proper screw link coupling, which is free to articulate and move. So quite a lot included with this model, and it does seem to be high quality stuff as well, which is good. Right, first look at the turbomotive and its die cast body. Is it going to have a nice metallic finish to it? I hope so. Let's see. Time for the reveal. Let's pull off the plastic wrap. Oh, if I can. I think it's trapped around the engine. No, I got it. Here it comes. <sighs> yeah, look at that. Yeah, it's it really does have a beautiful, beautiful finish to it. The perfect satin sheen that I always look for on a steam loco. And we've got metal whistles here. Well, safety valves, I guess. Uh, that must be the whistle. Yeah, they're metal, which is great as well. It just makes the loco look like it's good quality. And uh, yeah, the loco body is cold to the touch, which does suggest the die cast that we've been promised. Right, let's lift this up very gradually, gently. This is just ridiculous. It is ridiculous. <laughs> It's very, very heavy indeed, like ridiculously heavy. Hornby did say that this was the heaviest steam loco they'd ever produced. I wasn't sure whether I would believe that or not, but holding it in my hands here, it certainly seems to be. I can't remember lifting up any steam locomotive really and feeling more weight than I do here. It's incredibly chunky and heavy. Um, which begs a lot of questions, you know, is this going to have a mechanism strong enough to operate smoothly, even down to the low speeds? 
I don't know. I don't know because this is seriously heavy. The tender, though, does seem to be plastic bodied, which is interesting. So I'm not sure how that lamp is going to work through touch. Um, there is obviously some wizardry here that I don't understand, unless it's going through the metal handrails on the side. I don't know. We'll just have to test it and see. But it's safe to say that this is a very, very impressive loco. And we'll take a close look at the level of detail and the other features in just a second. But first of all, let's have some background on the Turbomotive in real life. The LMS Turbomotive was a one-off experimental steam locomotive designed by William Stanier. The engine was created in 1935 and was based on the existing Princess Royal class. Unlike the Princess Royal, which ran on traditional cylinders and Walshert's valve gear, the Turbomotive used steam turbines, whereby pressurised steam was used to rotate a special type of bladed fan known as a turbine. Using turbines instead of cylinders to convert the energy from the steam into motion had a huge number of advantages. It was much simpler than cylinders, which require valve gear consisting of countless moving parts to achieve all of the timings necessary, none of that needed with a turbine. They just need a steady stream of steam and that's it. The turbines also produced a very smooth power output, which gave a much more comfortable ride and it eliminated hammer blow on the track, which reduced maintenance. The turbomotive was also more efficient than cylinder-based locomotives, which saved on coal, although it wasn't quite so efficient at the lower speeds, supposedly. A disadvantage of turbomotive was the need for a separate turbine to allow the locomotive to go backwards. This turbine was much smaller, having only four rows of blades, as opposed to the 18 rows on the forwards turbine, which made the engine much weaker in reverse. So, the turbomotive was a relative success. So, why weren't all future locomotives built with turbines instead of cylinders? Well, I think it was because cylinder technology was so ubiquitous, well understood and completely ingrained into the very fabric of the railways that to change at this late stage would have been just too much. Also, to maintain such a unique design before it became commonplace was very expensive, unlike cylinder-based engines where parts were plentiful. Indeed, in 1949 one of the turbines failed and it was decided that to repair the loco would be uneconomical and so she was rebuilt into a traditional Princess Royal with cylinders in 1952. Just a couple of months later it was completely destroyed in the Harrow and Wealdstone rail crash and for the second time in its life it was deemed uneconomical to repair. This time no fancy rebuild occurred and this fascinating engine was scrapped forever. So there she is, Hornby's Turbomotive up close and personal for you. And sure enough, this is a wonderful model. I think it is tremendously well presented, very, very well built, and exactly as weird and unusual as I hoped it would be. Very, very impressive. I have to say though, for me, this is not worth the money, not for £240 or even more at the RRP, £266 something, simply because like the real Turbomotive, this model is outwardly relatively simple. It doesn't have any valve gear or anything which has to move, most locos do, this one doesn't. And again, like the real Turbomotive, there's not a great deal of complex pipework on the loco body which has had to be replicated. Even the decoration is relatively straightforward because there's not a great deal of lining and such. So I can't really see any reason why this would have to be pretty much the most expensive steam locomotive I've ever purchased. However, like I say, it is a very high quality model. The weight is exactly as Hornby promised, 589 grams loco and tender. Most of that in the loco because it is die cast. And I have to say, yeah, the fact that this is die cast is very, very impressive. It lends it a great finish, not to mention a very hefty weight. That alone does not justify the price for me though, because of course you've got models like the Acura Scale Deltic, which are even heavier still by a couple of hundred grams, and those models are much more complex than this. They've got more lighting on board and still they are cheaper. Having said that though, this Turbomotive does seem to have a lot of features. 
We've got lamps on the front, which I believe will work. I haven't seen it yet, but I understand that is the case. And this lamp bracket on the smoke box door, apparently that is removable and you can pop the detailed lamp into the same hole. And then apparently that lamp will turn on and work. Again, I'll test that later on. Obviously, you've also got the lamp on the back of the tender, which the instructions said would work, as well as the firebox LED lighting, which it looks as though will also work. So while I do think this is too expensive for what it is, it is great to see that they have thrown a lot of features at this model, rather than do what Hornby sometimes do and make a model very expensive and just sell you a load of garbage. <coughs> In terms of the quality, I have to say it is very high here. Not perfect, but pretty high. There is a minimum of visible glue. We have got a little bit on the firebox here. We've got one missing part down here. I believe there should be a little handle on this cylinder area, for want of a better term, because there is one on the other side. The smoke box dart, slightly crumpled. That looks as though it's had a bit of a bump in transit, and touching it, it appears to be loose as well, so we'll have to watch that. And to avoid light leakage on the front lamps, they've put this foam underneath the front buffer beam, which is clearly visible from the outside of the model and has not been done very carefully. These are the only quality issues I have, and most of the model is presented excellently, but at £240, I wasn't expecting to find any quality issues here on this model, and the fact that I found four or so is a little bit concerning. Anyway, let's take a look at the model. You've been looking at this side so far, but this model is not symmetrical, so if I show you the other side of the loco body, you can see that it is considerably different. It looks a little bit more like a standard locomotive, if you ask me, with its splashes and pipework and such, although there are still some unusual components which add to the interest. In terms of the decoration, you've got an excellent finish on the body. It really does look great. Same with the smoke box, great satin finish on that. The cab looks a little bit more plasticky and that's because this is actually made of plastic. So slight mismatch in the finish there, but it's nothing too serious. Not a great deal of lining on this model, but we have got a little bit between the loco boiler and the smoke box. The running plate is well lined as well, and this lining has been done very nicely and precisely, as you can see. And you've got a detailed cab as well with the classification and the running number on the side, which have all been well applied. The centres of all of the wheels have been painted as well, and these look pretty good, look at that. And the same goes for the bogey wheels at the front as well, which have their axles painted silver. Let's take a look at some of the details then. So underneath the cab, you do have some pipe work here, which has been separately fitted and separately painted. The sort of rear pony slash firebox area is again, quite an unusual shape but this has all been replicated on the model, which is awesome. Does the rear pony actually touch the track and turn? Yes, it does. So hopefully that will look okay as the loco runs and it shouldn't cause any problems over curves and such, which is good to see. On the front end, we've got a detailed buffer beam, which has the vacuum pipe pre-fitted. And of course you do have the option to fit the screw link couplings if you'd like. The buffers are made of metal and they are sprung. Look at that. Yep, sprung buffers. I'd be furious if they weren't sprung at this price, but they are, so that's okay. You've also got this sort of hinged plate at the front of the loco and they've made that move. I don't know why. It's a bit strange, isn't it, that? But uh, it does move and uh, I guess that is an additional feature, which is pretty interesting. In terms of the smoke box, you've got this double blast pipe chimney, which has been nicely presented. And then you've got a fair bit of pipe work and hand railings going along the side of the body, which are separately fitted. You've also got the safety valves here, which are made of metal, and they look absolutely fantastic as a result. But really, these are the only metal finished components we have on the model. Other pieces, such as the whistle and one or two of the other bits and bobs, they are clearly made of plastic and they have quite a different finish as a result. So yeah, a little bit disappointing perhaps for such an expensive model. Up on top of the cab, we've got these vents which are free to move so you can let some light inside the cab if you'd like to. You've also got glazing on the outside of the cab which has been fitted very flushly to the outside of the body which is great to see. The cab has cab doors pre-fitted, which are posed quite realistically, I like the way that looks. And there's also a metal tender full plate too. 
And inside the cab, there is a lot of detail here. The gauges have been fully picked out. We've got separately fitted parts. The regulator there is separately fitted. And of course, we have that opening for the Firebox LED lighting, which I'm hoping will look pretty good as well. In terms of the tender, I'm not 100% sure whether this is new tooled or not. I think it could be because I can't find one that matches it in the rest of my collection. But the fact that it doesn't have Hornby's new drawbar connector does kind of suggest that this is an existing tender, but it might well not be. Regardless, it has been put together very nicely. Although it must be said the finish of the tender, the colour of it, does not match the locomotive. Hopefully you can tell that. Yeah, it's much more of a plum colour, whereas the loco colouring is uh, certainly more of a deep maroon. So again, a little bit embarrassing for the amount of money here, but the decoration itself is done well. You've got the LMS lettering, which is nicely applied, complete with its outline slash drop shadow, lining all the way around the body of the tender, and also quite some complexity on the underframe as well, where all these little arches are lined. You've got the axle boxes and the springs, which are separately painted, and all of the steps and such are lined as well. So it's a genuinely beautiful beautiful and decorative tender. The coal load is again quite realistic. I like the shape and the detail in this load. Yeah, that looks really good and it is removable. So you can pull that out and replace it if you really want to. And here's the front end of the tender where as you can see, there's plenty of detail as well as a little bit of painted detail here as well. And then in the back of the tender, there's more detail where the water filler is. Uh, this doesn't open like it did on the much cheaper Curoscale Manor, so it's not completely feature packed, but that's not a necessary feature really. And then around the back, you've got that separately fitted lamp, which I've already mentioned. You've got the various plates on the back, which are the builder's plates and then the sort of capacity of the tender and such. The rear buffer beam is very nicely detailed. You've got the hook pre-fitted, vacuum pipes, more sprung buffers, and then you've got the NEM tension lock coupling at the back, which is very slightly sprung, and it does return back to the center when it is sprung. So hopefully that will work fine. So this is a very beautiful model. It's incredibly unusual, and on the whole, it has been put together very nicely. Despite the simplicity of the locomotive, it certainly seems to have a lot of features, and the massive weight makes this pretty impressive. I do think though for the money, the mismatch between the loco and the tender color is pretty much unforgivable, and so are the slight issues in quality. However, I think to make my final ruling on this locomotive, I'll need to know how this thing performs, and I'll also want to take a look at the mechanism. So I think that's what we have to do next. Let's get started with that. So there she is down onto the track, looking super cool, the all new Hornby Turbomotive. And I've already filmed the initial performance test and I'll show you how that went in just a second. After that though, I took the Loco apart to look at the mechanism and that's what I wanna talk about first. My first question is about the front coupling. We had a NEM included in the accessories bag to fit to the front of the Loco, but I can't for the life of me figure out where it's supposed to go. There's definitely no way to fit that coupling to the front bogey. So I'm confused as why we're paying for these front couplings when that's not a feature supported by the model. Very strange. I also decided to have a go at fitting the front lamp as described in the instructions. And it was very tricky to get the lamp bracket off. I thought to start with that it was glued on, but it wasn't. I think it was just a very tight fit. And then I put the lamp in. Again, very, very tricky to get this in because it is such a tight fit. And the smoke box dart, which was already loose, ended up coming off and I had to glue that back in. But uh, yeah, that's what it looks like with the lamp fitted. Not a very effective lamp as you'll see later on, but it looks pretty good there fitted to the Loco. In terms of pickups, each of the tender wheels has a pickup on it, so that's pretty decent. As I said earlier on, we do have the sort of outdated now Hornby drawbar, which is screwed, and then you've got the separate wire and plug, which is a little bit ungainly. Not too sure what the reason for this is. I guess there's two potential reasons. It's either it's taken them so long to get this model out that it's already out of date by the time it released, or maybe because the Loco is so heavy, they decided to go for something more rugged. I'm not sure which it is, but this doesn't look as good as the new Hornby drawbar design that we've seen. 
The loco base keeper plate is screwed in place and undoing those screws reveals that the base is fully removable and this has pickups on it for every driving wheel so we've got a lot of pickups on this model and it's also quite easy to access them all for servicing and cleaning which is great. The loco driving axles have proper bearings fitted to them which is great to see and we've just got the single driven axle which is the centre one so nice and simple there. Now the instructions describe the DCC socket as being in the tender, whereas the diagrams clearly show the socket inside the loco. So useless instructions here, which is accurate. To find out, I decided to take the loco body off first. So it's a screw at the front underneath the front bogey. You don't have to remove the front bogey to do this. And then there's another screw at the back, which is the tender drawbar screw. This reveals the very heavy diecast chassis, which seems to be pretty good quality. And indeed, here is the 21 pin DCC socket, so it is indeed inside the loco. And that makes sense because if it was in the tender, all of the wires for these LED lights for the lamps would have to go through the drawbar. And of course, with this old fashioned four pin drawbar, that wouldn't have been possible. So yeah, I guess that makes sense. You have got a pre-fitted sugar cube speaker at the front here, which is a great inclusion. And of course, we also have the lights in the firebox as well. The choice of motor though is quite interesting. On Hornby's other new locos, the P2 for instance, they used a new and different type of motor which was actually much better and more powerful and such. Here in the turbo motive it looks as though they've reverted back to the motor that they always used to use in their plastic bodied locos, which is an interesting choice given that this loco is considerably heavier than those plastic bodied locos and this does show through in the performance as you're going to see later on. The motor handles it okay but not brilliantly. And then we've got the massive flywheel on this motor as well which is a five pole motor by the way. So that's what's inside the loco but the instructions obviously described how to get into the tender so I had to take a peek inside and see how the lighting in the tender works and there's not a great deal to see here. You've got the circuit board for the lighting and the lights themselves are kind of behind covers so you can't really see too much of them. However you have got these sensors on either side which face outwards and it's not entirely clear how this works but there seems to be a coil of wire in each of these sensors so I guess they are sort of detecting perhaps the capacitance of your fingers as you touch the side of the tender and that's what toggles the lights on and off. Quite interesting again this is a first I've never seen anything like this on a Hornby Loco before so that's pretty interesting. And then in terms of the back-to-back -back gauge on the Loco, they came in at 14.2 to 14.3 millimetres, which is just comfortably below the standard. That shouldn't cause any problems. So overall, it's a very high quality mechanism. I like it a lot. Looking a bit outdated now compared with the mechanism we got on the P2, but still it ticks most of the boxes. So with that, let me jump back in time and show you how that first performance test went. All right, moment of truth time. Remember, the real turbo motive was buttery smooth, and so will this model have to be if it's to get a good mark. And of course, that's difficult to do when a loco is super heavy like this one is, so I'm very interested to see how this is going to work. First question, though, does it work at all? Forwards direction. Let's give it some juice and see. Here we go. Turbo motive, first ever run. Here we go. Wow, <laughs> that was marvellous. What an incredibly smooth start that was. Yeah, that was smooth. Let's go past at 50% speed. Yeah, that is awesome. That is really, really awesome. In terms of lighting, we've got, yeah, we have got the lamps at the front of the engine working and they're a great brightness. So we've got white in forwards direction, and then in reverse, we've got red. So that is incredible. That is not something that I think I've ever seen from Hornby before. That is new to me. And then in the firebox, we've got the LED, which, yeah, I would say is flickering there. That's a really nice effect. It's actually a good brightness. It's not too overstated, but bright enough to be noticeable. That's really good. In terms of the rear lamp, there's nothing at the moment. Let's tap it on the side. Nothing. No, I'm not seeing any. Actually, 
I, I cannot see a thing with the naked eye, but through the camera, I can see a light coming on there. Now, let me show you this light, and then look at the lights on the front again. <laughs> Why are they so bright and this one so dim? Let me adjust my angle here and try and show you this better. So if you get it right at the back here, yep, yeah, that toggle is working. Uh, it's just very, very dim. Let me turn it up to full power. Better? No. <laughs> okay. Reverse. Yeah. I mean, they work, but really you have to look at them from right down at track level and head on like this in order to see it. Yeah, I hope that feature didn't cost a lot to include because <laughs> if it did, it's not worth it. Right, what is the crawl like? Let's have a look at that. It's not been running yet, so if this isn't at its best, then obviously I will let this run in before making any final judgments, but it looked as though it was gonna be good. Is it good? Let's turn this up and see. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a little more power. It's moving. It does keep stopping though. And I have to give it more every time. We're now at 30. <laughs> oh, and it started. So there's definitely torque there for the Loco to move itself, but it is struggling at the moment. Again, that's not surprising given how weighty this model is, but at moments like that, you can see it starting to crawl and going very slow indeed. So at the moment, it can't sustain that. I am hoping that once it's running, it will be better for that, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, the other question is torque. A heavy loco requires a lot of torque. Has it got any? Fingers in front of the front buffer beam. Let's go up to 50 speed. No. Move my hands away, it starts. Hold it still, no torque at all. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's great that this loco is so heavy. But at the moment, and I should stress at the moment, it's looking as though the mechanism is not adequate for a, a loco that is this heavy. That might change as the loco runs in, but uh, yeah, for now that seems true, although it is beautifully smooth. Uh, have we got the flywheel effect here? Let's cut it off. Cut. Yeah, doesn't stop dead. It sort of decelerates more gradually, so that's looking pretty good. For now then, let's get this going around the track. Let's run this in fully. 50% forwards, let's see how it handles the curves. Okay, so it's uh, a modest speed, isn't it? <laughs> and it seems to be growing ooh, increasingly modest as it goes around the track. Slowing down dramatically on the curves and then speeding up after the curves. So yeah, again, this could improve with running in, but at the moment that is a little bit concerning. It's great that this loco is die cast, and it's awesome that this loco is the heaviest steam loco out there. But such a heavy loco requires a pretty beefy mechanism to get around those curves without slowing down. And at the moment, this is struggling quite significantly on those curves. So I've got mixed feelings at the moment. It feels like a 240 pound locomotive, but based on the way it's performing, it looks as though it's just got your typical Hornby mechanism. When the loco is twice as heavy as usual, that could have been a mistake. But I'm going to let this run in. It's going to have 30 minutes forwards, 30 minutes backwards. And then when we come back, I'll do some more testing and we'll see if this has improved. All right, folks, I'll be back in just a second. All right, folks, that is running in complete. And I'm happy to say that on the curves, this certainly improved as it ran in. So... How it's going to perform with a load, I'm not entirely sure, but it's certainly better than it was when I filmed that first lap, which is good. The front lamp that I fitted, I have to say, is completely ineffective. As it runs along, you can just about see that there's a light in there from some angles, but it's way too dim to be noticeable. Now, it does look as though I might be able to push this in a little bit further. It doesn't look as though it's pushed in all the way, but because of how tight a fit it is, it really is stuck fast there. There's no way for me to push that in any further. So your mileage may vary on that. Perhaps if you get a looser fitting lamp, you might be able to shove it in further and it will look better. 
but it's nowhere near as bright as the lamps above the buffer beam. So again, I hope that feature didn't cost a lot because it really doesn't bring anything to the model. Anyway, in terms of tractive effort, I measured 0.66 newtons, which should be enough for this loco to haul around 38 coaches on straight and level track, which is marvelous. But uh, again, due to that lack of torque, that's not really something you're gonna to wanna to do. But what's the torque like now? It was barely, well, in fact, I don't think it could turn its wheels before, before running in. Uh, what's it like now? Let's turn it up to 50. Yeah, now it is just about able to turn them. So there is a slight improvement there as well. Although, again, you don't want your loco doing this. Loading it up this much is not going to be good for that motor. So I'm going to stop doing that now. How is the crawl now? Let's have a look. It was pretty good before, but it wasn't able to sustain itself. Is it any better now? Let's take a look. I'm easing it up on the controller now in forwards. Here it goes. Yeah, it did start to move. There you go. I think it stopped again now. No, no, it's going again. <laughs> so yeah, it's a trifle inconsistent. It is very slow and smooth, which is good. But um, yeah, it's struggling to maintain it. There we go. Hand off the controller now. So, I mean, really, it's a pretty decent crawl. And once you get above the crawl, it is very, very smooth indeed. So... In general, I really like the performance of this. It's very realistic, and I guess it's quite simple because you haven't got the valve gear on the outside, which again helps it to run very smoothly. Uh, you've got nothing binding up, as you can see, as it runs along at this speed. So, in many ways, it runs very realistically. You know, it's buttery smooth, just like the real turbomotive. It's really, really pleasing to run, uh, particularly now that it's handling those curves better. All right, so how does it handle those curves with a load, though? And I don't want to load this up too much, but I've set up six Hornby LMS coaches. So I'm going to go and couple up to those, and we'll see how we get on. So let's test the coupling. Here we go. A good test is how precisely I can couple. So let me slow down and back it up. Yep, quite precisely. So... In terms of controllability, it's looking really, really good. Okay, let's start. Let's go for 50% speed forwards, and let's check this out with some coaches. Here she goes, smooth start, up to 50, there we go. And we'll catch up with Turbomotive in just a second. And on the middle line, I've got a Princess Royal class, which is the engine, obviously, that Turbomotive was rebuilt into after the turbine failed and she was just turned into a regular princess. So that's what they look like. Very similar looking loco, well I guess from a distance at least, with some Pullmans there. And then on the inside line, I do hope you'll pardon the noise, but we've got the only other turbomotive I've ever collected, and this is a Triang one. Uh, it actually started out as a Triang princess, but uh, somebody else, not me, converted this into a turbomotive and I've had this for a good long while now uh, so I've always had a turbomotive but obviously this is not a patch on the Hornby one that I've just looked at but still an interesting little article nevertheless. Right let's see how the new Hornby one handles an incline. All right here we go a good speed for the time being. Yeah slowing down on the curves and recovering slightly on the incline, although running quite a bit slower. You know, I would say that is a lot better. Yes, that is much, much better. There are locos in the collection with better torque, that's true, but honestly, given this loco's weight, and given that this appears to be just running a standard Hornby motor, I really think the performance there is pretty good. Running in is important with these, so if you're getting sluggish, weak performance to begin with, definitely give it that 30 minutes forwards and then backwards because uh, with mine at least that has brought about a massive improvement the torque isn't fantastic i should say that and if you do have tighter curves and lots of inclines perhaps and lots of coaches coupled up you may see some problems but it's certainly not as bad as some that we've seen so that's great i'm pleased about that and doesn't it look wonderful as it runs along it's a beautifully unusual model 
and I'm actually really, really glad that Hornby produced one of these. It's something that I've always wanted a proper version of, and at long last, now I do. So, can I recommend one of these? That's a little bit unclear because they are extremely expensive. And while I think if these had have been priced reasonably, they would have sold quite well, I have to wonder whether these are actually going to sell that well, given how expensive they are. And so it might be that if you leave it and don't buy one for now, they may well get reduced in price in the future and become much more affordable. Having said that though, I could be wrong, they could still be really popular, they could sell out very quickly, and so if you did wait, there may be a chance of missing out. So I think it really depends on how badly you want one of these. If you're desperate to get one, you know, they're expensive, but there's nothing really wrong with these things, at least nothing too serious. Yeah, I would go for it. If you quite fancy one, but you're not too sure, then I think I would recommend to you, just wait. If they all sell out, well, no big deal, it was a lot of money. And if they do come down in price, you might be able to snag yourself a bargain. In terms of value for money, yeah, I'm still confused as to why these need to cost 240 to 270 odd pounds. Yes, it's a heavy loco. Yes, it's been put together nicely, but it's also quite a simple loco. There's no valve gear, there's no nameplates. The decoration is relatively straightforward. You don't have tons of pipe work and complex detailing on these and they haven't taken the trouble to upgrade the mechanism to better equip it to handle the masses of loco weight. So yeah, I think over 200 quid, this is a bit of a rip off. It's not that bad because they have thrown a lot of features at it. And you know, if all of the lamps worked properly and they're all the same brightness, then yeah, sure, maybe that would have some extra value as well, but they're not so impressive because some of them are dazzlingly bright and others are barely noticeable at all. So mixed feelings on that as well. Overall though, now that I've spent the money and got the Loco, I can't say that I'm disappointed with it. I think it looks wonderful, and after running in, it's performing pretty excellently as well. So well done Hornby, great Loco, a very, very welcome addition to the collection. And now for some ratings for the all new Hornby Turbo Motive. The level of detail I've given four star. Now there's some great detailing on this loco and they've certainly thrown a lot of features at this in terms of the lamps and the other lighting and such. Really, really impressive. Great cab on this, plenty of detail on the bodywork, sprung buffers, moving detail parts such as that hinged section at the front and the vents on top of the cab. Having said that, there's a slight mismatch in the color between the loco and the tender, which I noticed and it bothers me. And there's also a mismatch in the brightness of the lamps. Now, I guess the one on the smoke box could have been my fault. Maybe I fitted it wrong or something like that. But the one on the tender is fitted at the factory. So there's no way that's my fault. It's a great detailed loco, one or two minor issues. The performance is pretty good. It certainly deserves a high score. The crawl is pretty decent and it's nice, smooth and quiet as it runs along. However, because of its extreme weight and the fact that they haven't really upgraded the motor in any way that I can see, it does suffer a little bit with poor torque and you can see this when the Loco enters curves under a load and also on the incline. This also makes the crawling a little bit inconsistent as well because the motor is fighting to move all the weight of the loco and the weight of the flywheel which is coupled directly to it. Not a massive issue but I've seen other locos with much better torque and therefore actually better pulling power even though they may be lighter than this loco. The pulling power itself though thanks to the sheer amount of weight measured in at 0.66 newtons which should translate to around 38 coaches on straight and level track which is really good. Bear in mind the Loco's wheels are barely turning at this point, so I don't recommend coupling this many coaches up to it, but that is certainly powerful compared with my readings of other Locos. The mechanism is generally really, really good. Not very many ways to fault this because you've got lots of pickups on all the driving wheels and also on the tender wheels. It's nice and easy to access. You can chip it reasonably easily. It does have a five pole motor with a flywheel, which is a great feature. I like that a lot. However, they've gone back to the old style drawbar with this for some reason, and maybe that is gonna be more robust and strong for a loco of this weight, but equally it doesn't look as good as the newer design, and it's less convenient to uncouple the loco and tender this way. 
They also appear not to have made any change to their choice of motor in this Loco, despite the masses of increased weight on the Loco, which has had an effect on the performance, but not to a massive extent, so I've not knocked it down too much here. The quality again is fantastic, but not perfect. It is basically all metal, the Loco at least, which is fantastic, and it's got a great finish to it as well, which I like. However, there are one or two glue marks, a couple of wonky details, as you might have seen. So I have knocked it down one star for those issues, although I've seen a lot worse, nothing too bad here. Value for money then, I've given a middle of the road score of three star. It is extremely expensive with its RRP of £266.49 or £240 at the retailers. But it's not a complete rip-off because the features of the model are reflected in the price. The massive weight, the level of die cast, the number of lights on this and such, the other details. So to an extent you do get what you pay for and the features of the model are reflected in the price. However, given that the quality was imperfect and the way that some of these features have been implemented, I don't think it's quite worth the amount of money Hornby are asking here, and other manufacturers seem to be offering models with similar features for much less money than this, so I've given it 3 star. Overall then, that is 7.92 out of 10, or a grade of B. Let's put that into the ranking, where it is 16th place above the P2 Streamlined and below the Sonic Models A5. Generally, not very many complaints with this. It is extremely expensive and you don't quite get what you pay for in my opinion, but it's far from a poor model and once it's on the track with some coaches, it does look very impressive, particularly with all of those lamps working. Well folks, that should just about do it for this review. I really hope you enjoyed looking at another strange low coat from Hornby and there have been a lot of these in the last few years. We've had Turbomotive, but we've also had the various P2s, which were strange. We've had the Hush Hush Locos. We've got unique Locos, such as Lion and Stevenson's Rocket. So this is the latest in a long line of very unusual prototypes from Hornby. And I hope to see it continue, because these Locos are some of the most enjoyable out there. They really are. So do comment down below and let me know what you think about this turbo motive. What do you think of the price? Do you think it is justified because of the extra weight and features? Or do you think despite those extra features and the weight, the Loco is still failing to hit the mark? It's not entirely clear, is it really? I think it's too expensive for what it is, even though it is a big step up in many areas. But you know, that's just me. I could understand if you felt differently. So yeah, do share that with me. For now though, thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to grab one of these Locos, I do have affiliate links in the description for you. But with that, that's all I've got to say. So thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you on the next one. All right, cheers everybody. You take care.